Hello, and welcome to the City of Truth. Episode 7, The Existence of God, Part 3. For those few listeners out there that have been following along, I apologize for the brief hiatus. I was on unpaid podcast paternity leave. Luckily, four weeks was all it took for my child to become fully self-sufficient, so I'm back. Today we'll wrap up our discussion on the existence of God. While there are over a dozen other arguments we could discuss, this last round focuses on largely practical considerations, and so rounds out our approach. We've got three of them. Let's get into it. 7.1. The Argument from Free Will This argument is indirect. When it comes to the free will debate, I think our focus is way off base. There are scientists trying to do experiments that will show free will as a product of the brain, and arguments about the nature of consciousness, and so on. I'm not discouraging those things, and to be clear, there are no experiments that have even marginally indicated that free will is an illusion despite the claims of some pop science commenters. But our fundamental perception here is way more important. It's not just a science question, it's also pre-scientific. It's those foundational beliefs that we've discussed. We all have the experience of making choices. That's something every single human being in possession of reason knows. Someone insults me. I can choose what to do. I can respond or take it in stride, or punch them in the face, and it's up to me. I'll have inclinations, but they don't force my hand. That's my perception. That's your perception. The fundamental perception of at least sometimes making choices is universal. It is as basic an experience that humans can have, so basic that it is perhaps more fundamental than sight, or at least on par with it. We have high confidence in sight, and well we should. If I'm in a stadium and I see a bunch of guys playing football, and another 50,000 people do too, then we can all be pretty confident that there's some dudes playing football, right? Virtually every scientific experiment we do relies on human sight. So what would you say to someone who denies that universal human perception? What do you say to the person who claims that there's no one playing football down there, that it's all an illusion, that you've never seen anything in your entire life? Well, the consequences of that are tremendous. Of course, like elsewhere when we've considered our foundational beliefs, it means the death of science. Really, it's the death of knowledge, of experience. This is even more fundamental than the whole maybe we live in a computer simulation thing. In the computer simulation argument, we still can trust our perceptions. There really are 50,000 of us watching a football game. It's just that our understanding of the definition of a football game needs to change. A football game is a computer simulation of that interaction. But even that isn't doubting that we all saw it, and can be confident that at least that simulation was running. We all trust our fundamental perceptions. We can't live otherwise. If everyone around us is just some mass collective delusion, then it doesn't matter if you kill people, or waste your day fantasizing, or wallow in your own filth, or save the country, or eat a baker's dozen of donuts. It's just variations on a delusion. None of us thinks that's true. We accept that there's some sort of world out there, that we experience it, and it means something. What we do is real and has consequences. We also have laid our groundwork here as the acceptance of science and its principles. That means trusting the validity of our basic perceptions, especially when they're collective. Imagine for a moment that we don't have free will. That means that billions of us, going about our lives, are all subject to the same collective delusion. How utterly bizarre, first of all. But secondly, why would you trust anything ever? Humanity's most basic perceptions are untrustworthy. They can be complete bunk. And they are so fundamental that you can't even have arguments about them without invoking them. It's the functional equivalent of writing off all existence. Maybe sight is an illusion too. Maybe all our senses are. So we can never know anything, we can never do anything meaningful, we can't accept science, and we can't even trust that there are other people out there. That's based on these perceptions. Maybe it's just you, one deluded brain in a sea of darkness. You don't really believe that. 
neither do I. The position of total cynicism is self-defeating and leaves you worthless and miserable. And it's not even based on a good argument, just a ridiculous assertion. I'm just not going to believe our collective perceptions. But the other case, the case where we aren't crazy people, the case where we accept that, yeah, oranges are real and you aren't just a figment of my imagination, that case requires that we trust our fundamental perceptions. And we fundamentally perceive that we make choices. So we ought to accept that we make choices. If we do make choices, then we are not strictly causal. We aren't like a rock rolling down a hill. The part of us that does the choosing can't simply be decided by physical laws, because physical laws are determined. It says force X is stronger than force Y, so the object moves left. No choice, no debate. The attempt to reduce the question of free will to the quantum level is likewise unworkable. The quantum world is also deterministic, but by probabilities. There's still no choice happening. The weird stuff we see in the quantum world are fringe cases anyway, of one or two particles in extreme conditions. Most particles don't act independently. They're part of a larger entangled system, and that functions much more closely to our instincts about the classical world than the quantum world. Your brain is one giant entangled mess of particles. They aren't a single weird fuzzy thing going through two slits or entangled across the universe, and even if they were, and there was choice involved with quantum particles, what's doing the choosing? You've just kicked the problem back a step. The notion that free will can be reduced to quantum weirdness is just an example of quantum woo. The quantum world is weird, and so we can just use that weirdness to explain away whatever we want. That derives from ignorance about how the quantum world works. Also, I've said quantum way too many times now, and it's starting to sound like nonsense to me. Choice is non-physical. Let me say that again. Choice is non-physical. Physical systems are governed by mathematically precise laws. If human beings are nothing more than physical entities, then there is no choice. We are subject to a billions-wide, consistent, perpetual, and collective delusion. We either grant that human beings have some non-physical part to them, or we cannot trust our fundamental perceptions, and that includes all scientific work ever done. I'm not willing to accept that. If you want to treat it as an experiment and attempt to assess it on scientific grounds, that's fine. But your first data point is our fundamental perception. Imagine an event that you're studying, say a supernova that was so bright that it was visible in the day. You've got solid funding, so you interview every single human being on the planet. Every single person you talk to says that they saw the same supernova in the same part of the sky over the same three days. Would you need additional data to be certain about it? Exactly what evidence would you require to say it didn't happen? As for me, I'd be pretty satisfied with 7 billion confirmations. Let us also consider one last point, a sort of Bayesian statistical approach to the problem. The world looks like we have free will. The question, then, isn't what are the odds that free will exists in isolation. Rather, the question is what are the odds that free will exists given that the world looks precisely like we would expect it to if free will did exist. I, for one, can't think of a single piece of evidence that instead suggests that we don't have free will. There is nothing, no act, no impulse in man, however strong, but that some portion of mankind overcomes it. You can predict precisely nothing with 100% accuracy about the willful actions of man. Not one thing. Now, no one denies that we have a nature with its dispositions, or that we predictably act out of instinct at times. We do. But we regularly resist our dispositions. Place food before a starving dog, and he will eat if he's able, every time. Place food before a starving man, and he may decide that starvation is preferable. This is an oddity unique in the animal world. Not about food specifically, of course, but that man can never be pinned down. Perhaps the surest proof that man is free is that his actions are sometimes completely baffling. Okay, so here's the short version. Man has the fundamental perception of free will. If we reject that, we reject the reliability of fundamental perceptions, which means the rejection of all the things. So we should trust our perceptions. This means science is real. It also means we have free will, and that some part of humans is non-physical, the part that makes choices. 
This part that discerns and makes choices, we will call the soul. Therefore, human beings have souls. Does this prove that there's a God? Not directly, no. But if we are dedicated to our fundamental principles, we'd expect the human soul to have a cause, as human beings come and go all the time. Given that the soul is non-physical by definition, a physical cause doesn't work. And once again, we previously concluded that a non-physical cause of the universe must exist. It's not a proof, but it is more confirming evidence. 7.2 The Argument from Morality This argument is related to the prior one. Just like we have a sense of making choices, we likewise have a fundamental moral sense. That doesn't tell us anything about the nature of that morality, but given the previous argument, it should make us ponder that nature. We talked about this some in episode 3 on meaning. Morality itself can actually function as a demonstration that free will exists. It's impossible to argue that man is morally responsible for his actions without free will, at least in traditional terms. That system undergirds our whole lives, from our daily conduct to the legal system. We all act and operate on the assumption that individuals choose how they act and are moral agents. Now it's important to note that we're talking about morality in terms of belief in its objective reality, and not whether this or that person chooses to behave morally. You can have people who don't believe in the existence of an objective morality that then choose to live by a strict code. Nobody disputes that there are morally driven atheists and deeply immoral theists. One of St. Joan of Arc's besties later turned out to be a serial killer. A saint and a serial killer walking around side by side with at least the same public beliefs. That about sums up the spectrum. Belief isn't incidental to morality, mind you, but moral beliefs do you no good if you don't live by them. So what is the traditional origin of morality according to Western thought? On what grounds can one claim that there is an objective morality? In a word, purpose. Really, if you think about it, purpose is the only grounds we have for stating whether something is good or bad. Good and bad are context-dependent. For example, let's say I made a cup. It has cracks in the sides, it leaks, it's ugly, it's impossible to clean, and it makes things taste weird when you drink out of it. It's fair to say that that's a bad cup. The purpose of a cup is to hold liquid, generally for someone to drink. This cup is awful at that, so I could say it's a bad cup. Now, this isn't a moral statement, because a cup isn't responsible for its own state. The poor cup can't help it. The little guy's trying his best. Let's grant for this argument that free will does in fact exist, as we discussed above. What makes a bad human? Well, we can all pretty much agree that certain things that humans choose to do are bad. Murder is bad, rape is bad, theft is bad. Someone who does those things, at least habitually, is a bad person. But how does that make any sense unless we are saying that there is a way people should be? And how can we say how people should be without saying what they are for? We have to say that humans have a greater purpose to say that they aren't doing what they're supposed to do. We have to have an ideal human in our head, which is doing everything right, to conclude when someone is doing something wrong. This is the traditional Western view of morality. Other moral systems have been proposed. There's been three centuries now of writers attempting to propose a moral standard without rooting it in some extrinsic purpose. And in my view, they have failed. A good example is Kant's categorical imperative, an ingenious little thought that says you can assess the morality of an action by the consequences it would have to society if everyone did it. Is theft acceptable? Well, if everyone did it, private property ceases to exist. I would prefer that it did exist, and so stealing is immoral in a sense. But we find ourselves in a tragedy of the commons. The categorical imperative fails the psychopath test, as do most alternative moralities. It is true that it is in the best interest of society collectively that people act according to a moral code, so as to produce civilization. It is equally true that it is most emphatically not in the individual interest of each citizen to act morally, at least at times. And bridging that gap between what's good for all and what's good for me is impossible without the moral precept that I ought to value others the same as myself. It is a moral position to believe that we ought to follow the rule of law. It is a moral position to believe in the right of private property. 
these things are inextricably tied with the question of our purpose in the world. Perhaps someone may simply attempt to place constraints on this, however. We simply grant that all men have equal worth because it appears to be a functional belief, and then pursue whatever provides the greatest happiness to the greatest number. Well, what if the happiness I experience from killing you outstrips the misery caused by your death? Then wouldn't it be the moral thing to do for me to murder you? What about if I murdered the entire world in an instant? There's now no one but me, and I'm happy, so you could hardly argue that it's immoral. But surely no one would agree that this is true. Instead, we'd also have to grant additional restrictions based on common sense, that I have to consider the potential happiness of future people, perhaps, or that this is limited by a framework of human rights. But this is merely sidestepping the problem. No persuasive argument for the existence of morality can start with, consider all your equal and treat them as such, and do so within the framework of human rights as I understand them. That's solving the moral dilemma by simple declaration. We haven't addressed the problem at all. This can be useful, but it doesn't get to the heart of morality. There is a similar problem with the thought experiment suggested by Sam Harris. He suggests that the ideal society would be one that was constructed in such a way that you don't know where in that society you will end up. You would want to create the most ideal conditions for the largest number of people. But again, that operates from a hypothetical framework where you're considering the ideal good conditions for hypothetical people, not for yourself. If you only value yourself, then the question is pointless. Every proposed moral system we attempt to construct outside of a purpose framework results in similar problems. We end up with something quite different from morality. Could evolutionary forces explain it? If so, then morality changes. You can no longer argue that slavery was wrong. It was simply the nature of human society at the time. And if one day fascism is resurgent and wins out over democracy, the state of mankind will once again be different. Would the Holocaust, then, become morally acceptable? If not, then there is another standard. In the words of Peter Kreeft, if you can't make the distinction between accepted and acceptable, you can't criticize slavery. If you can make that distinction, you are admitting to objective morality. Human nature, likewise, is no source for morality. Our natural impulses often lead us to do terrible things. Every crime of passion is an act of human nature, after all. And let's consider the idea that our purpose is reproduction, to pass on our genes. There's two ways to think of that. The first would be that this is simply the thing that genes do, as Dawkins and others propose. In that case, there's nothing moral to the idea at all. It's simply a thing that happens. It's the explanation for morality. It doesn't provide a moral framework. The selfish gene is an attempt to explain away the origins of morality, not to propose a moral system. That's already a serious problem, because you can reasonably argue that we have a fundamental moral perception just like that of sight or choice. It also does a poor job of explaining morality. Very few of our moral choices, or the things we perceive to be moral, tie to successful propagation of genes. Morality leads to people choosing to be celibate. It leads to people allowing their entire family to die for a higher cause. And if we ever encountered sentient aliens one day, who wouldn't agree that we ought to afford them the same rights we do to ourselves? But there can be no genetic imperative there. If anything, by the selfish gene perspective, our absolute top priority should probably be the eradication of other life forms. I guess you could try to argue that it's gone awry and had unintended consequences, but if it actually appears to operate directly contrary to the theory, and in virtually every case where we consider an action to be the highest moral choice, then it doesn't appear to be a solid theory. The second way to take this reproductive theory is to say that, yes, it really does take the nature of a moral imperative. The perpetuation of one's genes, then one's family, and then the species is the moral duty of mankind. Now, I agree that the perpetuation of the species is a moral duty of mankind but reproduction as the moral duty of mankind actually has quite repulsive consequences. And this is quite apart from the fact that it doesn't really explain anything. Saying the purpose of humanity is to reproduce is like saying the purpose of hammers is to make hammers, to paraphrase Chesterton. It doesn't quite explain why you'd want them in the first place. And if reproduction is our primary moral duty, then St. Paul is a moral monster, while Genghis Khan is the most moral man who's ever lived. Rapists are moral priests are not. Prostitutes who give birth are moral. 
Someone without the ability to reproduce has no direct moral worth, and the reproduction of your own lineage is paramount over others. Nepotism is justified as is genocide. Reproduction can't be the predominant moral duty of mankind if it leads to moral consequences we universally reject. Can reasoned self-interest alone explain morality? No, as we've already examined. It's often the more reasonable course to act immorally. And again, if you choose to make the distinction between what is reasonable and what is moral, then there is an objective morality outside of enlightened self-interest. Conscience, too, can't explain it. Countless evils have been done according to conscience. And a sociopath has none. Does that make all of his actions moral? He's never in violation of conscience, after all. He doesn't have one. Well, of course not. His actions are still evil. If you had to pin the concept of morality to a single phrase, what would it be? I'd probably say self-sacrifice. Any system of morality proposed that's not based on purpose means proposing a system that's based on self-interest. As far as I can tell, there really is a dilemma here. Either moral action is out of self-interest or it's not. If it's not out of self-interest, we have to be valuing something greater than ourselves. But really, outside of some greater moral framework of a purpose for humanity, it never makes sense to value something above ourselves. It's basically impossible to provide entirely selfish reasons for something which has an essential nature of self-sacrifice. A lack of objective purpose to humanity also means that our goals are arbitrary. Curing cancer or peeing on every bathroom floor in Missouri, it's all the same. This is utterly deflating. There are other strange results as well. On what grounds can you claim to own anything? Isn't the defense of your property a moral position? If an aggressive nation invades another and slaughters its people, isn't it a moral position to say the first people have a right to defend themselves? That the invader's claim is unjust? If I decide that your iPhone is now my iPhone, do we just have a difference of opinion, or am I acting unfairly? And what about valuing truth? If I decide the sky is green, and everyone else is just a robot while I'm the only real person, and the earth is flat, and the lizard people are really running things, on what grounds do you have to complain? Sure, I based my views on whatever I felt like, or a YouTube comment section, but why is that any better than scientific rigor? Perhaps you'd claim that the scientific view leads to better outcomes, but for whom? For you? Perhaps I'm quite happy in my flat earth of lizardmen, while I'd be miserable in your scientific worldview. Who's to say what I ought to do when it comes to assessing the world if it suits my preferences? Let's presume we genuinely don't know whether there's any purpose to mankind. Which view should we prefer? From a purely pragmatic position, the belief in purpose wins in a landslide. Your actions have meaning. Your life has a moral dimension. You're not having a delusion about morality. Your right to condemn slavery. Your right to condemn the abuse of women. Right to condemn tyranny. Right to condemn theft. These aren't mere preferences, but realities in some way. Things like kindness and knowledge are good, truly and objectively good. The man who discovers a new particle is to be admired. The woman who sacrifices herself to save her children's lives is to be admired. The society that condemns injustice is to be admired. You are not arbitrarily enforcing your will on others when you defend your property. That it's yours is not simply your opinion. It's yours. Contrarily, we would live in a world where the only people who perceive reality are the mentally shattered. Depression is the correct response to the problem of existence, because nothing matters and we're all soon to die. There is no greatness. All that is held up as good and beautiful and noble and true and worthwhile is a delusion. Your suffering is real, and your death is real, and the death of those you love is real, and the pain of watching them waste away is real, and the genocides of history are real. But their nobility in that suffering? Arbitrary nonsense. The moral outrage against the genocide? Childish moralizing. Good is a delusion, but evil is not so easily done away with. Psychologically, you would be a rune. With no purpose, the appropriate approach to life is to maximize the extraction of pleasure for yourself alone, by whatever means necessary. Society will soon be a smoldering heap, such as the tragedy of the moral commons. Everyone else is in the same boat, after all. We can all agree that option one is preferable, right? And I hope we can all agree that there are moral evils. There are people who torture children for fun. 
That is evil. Like with choice, we have a universal perception of it. The consequence of this is that we must accept that humanity has a purpose. If we have a purpose, then where the heck did that come from? Clearly whatever causes humanity to exist. And we're back at God again. Whatever can provide us with purpose, and therefore with morality, must be what created human nature. Humanity has its specific qualities for that purpose, in the same way that a cup is made with a particular shape and material to fulfill its purpose. As we have already concluded on other grounds, that there is in fact a purely actual being that brought us into existence, then this being is the source of our purpose and moral quality. By studying human nature, which has its particular form in relation to its purpose for this very reason, just like the cup, or understanding this being that created us, we can reach definitive conclusions about morality. Remove this and there are no moral absolutes. There is no middle ground, and nearly everyone agrees in the goodness of self-sacrifice and the evil of murder. This isn't an absolute logical proof, but rather a demonstration that objective morality and theism are inextricably linked. Accepting one virtually guarantees the acceptance of the other. 7.3 the argument from intellect. The last argument we will consider is also indirect, but practical. We won't get too into the weeds with this one, or it would be an entire episode of itself, but it's worth considering. It's also a bit more technical, which is why I put it at the end. So if it seems a bit technical, don't worry about it. Briefly, it goes like this. We discussed before how the human mind must hold forms within it to say we have true knowledge of anything. The form that's in each tree, for instance, that determines that it's a tree and not a wood statue, must be the very same form that is in our minds when we think of the concept of a tree. If it were not, then no knowledge would be possible. We discussed this in episode 2 somewhat, and it's also one of our assumptions in the common sense model. Knowledge about the real world and communication of it is necessary for science to function. If you say we only have an approximation of that form, then we only ever have approximations with nothing to compare it to. Without truly apprehending any form, we can never say how close we are to the truth of the form, since we never know the form itself. Knowledge of the outside world therefore cannot exist. Such a conclusion contradicts our model and the fundamental precepts of science. This means that the mind really does grasp the form itself when we have knowledge. Forms are non-physical. They aren't identical with any tree, but the thing in every tree that makes them a tree. And if it exists in a tree, and it exists in our mind, in a completely different mode of being, where nothing physically manifests a tree at all, then the form must also be non-physical. A non-physical form can either be instantiated, as in the case of an individual tree, or held in the mind, as in the case of knowledge. It has two modes of existence. In the first case, it is a particular. We don't find treeness outside, we find individual trees. In the second case, it's a universal, and the universal is not instantiated. That means the mind holds within itself these universals, these forms that are non-physical. For the mind to do this, it must be non-physical as well. There is a part of our mind that is physical and actually works in much the same way as the real world, our imagination. We can only imagine particular instances of a concept. We can't picture treeness any more than it exists out in the world, and yet you know what a tree is. Or take a number. You know what the number 2074 is. And you do this without ever imagining 2074 of something. In fact, you probably couldn't do that in the first place. This demonstrates that our intellect is distinct from our imagination, if it wasn't already clear. Our imagination forms images, which are specific. Our intellect knows universals. Universals are non-physical. Therefore, so is the thing that contains them, the intellect. Between the intellect and when we discussed free will above, we see that there is this non-physical part of man. In fact, the term soul is precisely this, intellect and will. This is what spirit means in traditional Western thought. It's not about feelings or emotions. It is intellect and will and the actions of them. Similar to our argument from free will, this implies a god, if for no other reason than that souls themselves need an explanation for their existence, 
and one that is itself non-physical. Quote, now I ask you, what can be expected of man, since he is a being endowed with strange qualities? Shower upon him every earthly blessing, drown him in a sea of happiness, so that nothing but bubbles of bliss can be seen on the surface. Give him economic prosperity, such that he should have nothing else to do but sleep, eat cakes, and busy himself with the continuation of his species. And even then, out of sheer ingratitude, sheer spite, man would play you some nasty trick. He would even risk his cakes and would deliberately desire the most fatal rubbish, the most uneconomical absurdity, simply to introduce into all this positive good sense his fatal fantastic element. It is just his fantastic dreams, his vulgar folly that we desire to retain, simply in order to prove to himself, as though that were so necessary, that men are still men and not the keys of a piano, which the laws of nature threaten to control so completely that soon one will be able to desire nothing but by the calendar. And that is not all. Even if man really were nothing but a piano key, even if this were proved to him by natural science and mathematics, even then he would not become reasonable, but would purposely do something perverse out of simple ingratitude, simply to gain his point. And if he does not find means, he will contrive destruction and chaos, will contrive sufferings of all sorts, only to gain his point. He will launch a curse upon the world, and as only man can curse, it is his privilege, the primary distinction between him and other animals. Maybe by his curse alone he will attain his object, that is, convince himself that he is a man and not a piano key. Dostoevsky 7.4 Conclusion We've considered a lot of arguments about God here, and about related concepts. It seems clear that there are two models of the world that we can accept. One is a model with God in it. The other is a model without one. The godless model means we must reject one or more of the fundamental precepts of science. It means abandoning our universal basic perceptions as unreliable. It means abandoning the idea that we choose anything for ourselves. It means rejecting that child molesters and serial killers are evil, or that a soldier dying to save his platoon is good. It means the only grounds for accepting civilization are irrational, and it means your life has no purpose. The other model includes God. Perhaps some people see that as good, and others as bad. It seems clear to me that some people would simply prefer that a God didn't exist. But along with accepting that, you get moral good. You get purpose to life. You get science. You get true knowledge. You get some reason why we suffer. That means that we can have hope that all will be well in the end. If any of those things, morality, purpose, choice, science, hope, are non-negotiable to you, then you'd be far better off accepting a theistic model. I believe the world is rational. I believe we are free. I believe life is good. I believe that the moral choices we make aren't wasted or foolish. I believe in the scientific method. And therefore, I believe in God. There is so much more we could discuss on this topic. The Euthyphro dilemma, the Kalam argument, Leibniz's argument from contingency, Pascal's wager. This is quite obviously a pretty deep and important topic, but we need to move on. From this point forward, we will accept the existence of this broad philosophical notion of God. The consequences of this could not be more profound. Next week, we will begin discussing those consequences, as well as God's characteristics. 